Thank you, and welcome to CBTS Tech Talk. I'm the producer, Lance Hart, and today we'll be talking about the unnecessary risk of missed patches. I'm joined by two extremely knowledgeable techs that will do a little talking today. Uh, it might get a little confusing because it's two Johns. We've got uh, John Bruggerman, as always, our consulting CISO, and John Lloyd, Global Solution Architect. Johns? Johns. Let's jump right in. Yeah, I, so you have the un I. You have the unnecessary silent letter in your first name, and then I've got the unnecessary silent letter in the double L's <laughs> of my last name. So it works out. Yes. Silence is golden in yeah. one sense. <sighs> okay. So let's talk about patching. I know it's it's the top topic for every IT professional. They all want to talk about patching. Um, but I look at it from the cybersecurity perspective. Sure. Namely, when you think about patching, virtually every attack, leverages a vulnerability that hasn't been patched at this point in time. Um, and so it's it's a direct correlation. If you don't do patching, you're going to be vulnerable. There's going to be uh, excessive risk. And one of the things you want to think about is, okay, great. How do I know what to do and where do I get started? So what are you seeing out in the field? Yeah, I, I always equate that, like, how do you tie this into your security program? And when we start talking with customers and you ask, what what are you doing around security? You'll learn all about their MDR, EDR, SIM, SOAR, cool. tools, cool. all these things, tools, people, all that. And I equate it to putting, you know, a, a deadbolt and three chains on your front door and then leaving the window completely wide open, right? It is a part of that program. Now, why does it not get done? Well, for a couple of reasons I tend to see where right? it's almost kind of custodial work it's wildly important yeah. but not a lot of people want to do it and i think we'll talk through kind of getting into that program and, and things like that later but <clears throat> as we frame it up and i'd love to hear kind of sitting in the CISO seat i watch these events that happen you mentioned it always comes back to a vulnerability i watch these events where the pipeline right gets ransomware yes columbia Co yeah or name name and names All sorry right. no it's fine it's fine i don't think it's, i don't think we're good as public record uh but we try. You know, we watch the the blame game trickle up and then trickle back down. You have Columbia go. Oh, it was Microsoft's fault, right? You know, it's it's the yeah, it's the OEM's fault. And then all of a sudden, you have Microsoft coming back and going, "Well, here's the patch that we put out for that in March well, months ago, right?" Yeah. And now it starts to trickle back down. So it's you know, kind of the low level guy says, Oh, I made somebody aware of it. And it trickles up to the CISO. And then, you know, the FBI is involved and then you blame the OEM and then you watch that blame trickle all the way back down. Uh, and it's typically to, we didn't do a patch. So, you know, as you sit there as a CISO and you look at building, you know, attack surface management and this whole security strategy, where does patching fit into that? If you're running a security program? For me, when I ran my program, um, it was never a lot of fun to do, patching because you always risk breaking something um, and and you never want to apply a, a patch from windows i mean if you're a windows shop it's very easy microsoft is very regular they push out i mean it's patch tuesday i pretty much post uh, about patch tuesday the wednesday afterwards so it's the second tuesday of the month and let people know what vulnerabilities has microsoft patched that day i don't recommend putting that patch on wednesday right um you don't Typically, at least not in production. You can certainly do it in your test environment. Or Let it your, bake in. Let yeah. somebody else be the first. Yeah, and, and it's it's one of those things where uh, I had patching near the top of my list uh, because I was hit with the distributed denial service attack in 2001 when I was running my shop, and that's what got me into cybersecurity. So I know that we're only as strong as our weakest link. It's pithy, but it's true. Um, so... You want to make sure that you are doing regular patching and and to do it well, like you said, it's a program. People kind of sometimes tilt their head like, what are you talking about? It's a program. It's And they confuse it. What you want to do is you want to be regular about it. You want to put it on your schedule. You want to, I blocked out four hours of, you know, maintenance time every month to apply patches. I wasn't lucky enough to have a real test environment where I could simulate everything. But I wanted to make sure that if something went wrong, you got to have a way to back that patch back out. Right. Because you don't want to have a blue screen of death and discover, oh, no, now I don't have a way to get back and recover my system. So uh, it's definitely, it was a regular part of my day-to-day -day operations. Identify the patches, put them on the schedule, schedule them, and, and get them in there. 
And what about, so there's a ton of great tools, right? And we yeah. use tools when we help customers. Big tools, fix. Big fix is obviously, it's the one we use. I think it's the big winner in that space, but not even just patching tools, automation tools, right? Yes. Running, you know, Ansible playbooks, things like that. There's a lot of ways that you can relieve some of that burden. At the end of the day, though, you still need to inspect what you expect. Oh, yeah, yeah. Right? yeah. Or was it a successful patch? Did I, you know, I was using SCCM and we were applying the patch. We had a two-hour window. We hit two hours. It just stopped. Yeah. Right. Or I know 80 we ran out of drive we, space. Right. I was going to say 80% of my PCs, right. I don't know if it was because the memory was full or they never came online or what were my distribution points or relays in the network. Do I need them to be, there's a lot of complexity. You can go and build all of the tools and have all of the logos and spend a pretty penny on the flip side. Good luck going and hiring, you know, an army of engineers who do this day in and day out, as opposed to maybe somebody kind of, that oversees the program with some junior engineers or people kind of getting started out in the program. And I tend to see quite a bit that when I talk to customers, they say, we have patching. Okay. Right. Tell me about it. And they tend to restart every 12 months. We've got some junior level folks. You mentioned patch Tuesdays, you know, second Tuesday, let it burn in. We go to push it out. You said you mentioned only four hours. That was, you know, some time ago, I'm sure it's, it's more yeah. now, but I do it for 12 months at that point, I'm still doing 60% other things. So I'm getting more knowledgeable in our network, our business. Maybe I'm getting certs, doing other things. So now after a year, I don't want to keep being the patching person. Oh, God, no. Right? It is the boringest. I mean, in one sense, it's 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 not sexy. It's not typically considered as valuable in one sense. Um, and you're right. You You get somebody who's trained up and knows how to do it. Next thing you know, they want to move on to something else. They don't want to be a yep. patch person every, you know, that they, that's not their job. And, you know, that's not their only job in their mind. So it is, it's a, it's a challenge to keep that staff. So when we, you know, from a CBTS perspective, when we go and help customers and we're helping large enterprises globally with this patching, when we always say it's a program, talk to me a little bit, what's tools, what's people, what's the right mix? What's the, what's success look like in a patching program? Well, when we think about patching and it, as it relates to cybersecurity, not only is it a cybersecurity component, but it also gives you stability. I mean, because frequently when you have a patch, you know, the patch is there to fix a vulnerability that you either did know you have or didn't know you had. I mean, sometimes some people, I remember I, I, I got help desk calls while I was still the director and the CIO. People say, John, my, my printer won't print or my screen just, you know, went smaller and, and, you, you look into it and, oh, there was a patch for your particular motherboard that you had to have applied. And once you get it applied, now your your video display is working correctly or the screen doesn't, you know, you don't get a blue screen or the application doesn't fail. So it's more than just security for patching. Um, you can get performance advantages. You can get stability. You can also get compliance and regulatory because some, you know, regulations issued by the federal or state and local governments or even organizations like PCI you got to do it to stay compliant. So, you know, compliance is not security. We all know that. Um, but the, the tools that you want to put in place, it is people processing tools. You got to have good people. You have to have a good process and you have to have useful tools. And you're right. You can use it with, you know, a big name tool like Big Fix. You could use SSCM. Um, you can do, you know, Windows, uh, the other one that... Intune. Yeah, and, yeah. yeah. And, oh, I love Intune. I mean, yeah. Intune... Getting the visibility on the endpoints is fantastic. I mean, the, the ability to see what people are doing when you're joined to the, you know, yeah, the domain, it's, it's fantastic. You can see whether or not they didn't let you apply the patch. <laughs> Sometimes people are like, you see that little exclamation point that's telling you that you need to restart your computer? And they're like, no, no, I'm too busy. I'm like, uh, you can't be busy 24 hours a day. Well, that's what I think. Like, we talk about all the time, like, the biggest weakness in any security, uh, you know, program is the end, uh, end employee, right. You know, we it's, do it, training. They, they're, the, they're, they're whipping, they're the whipping people. Yeah. I mean, well, they, you've got, you know, you might have one data center or, you know, five buildings, but 5,000 employees, right. Who are accessing from all these different devices who aren't as security. My almost a lot of organizations. Now you see the email says caution. This is from outside yes. or, you know, don't click. So everybody's trying to solve that. Who is the, the end employee, right? That's my easiest access for a bad actor. And, I know from my world, five years ago, if I was working from home, I was VPNing in yep. every day. Now, I know we got some security folks in the room. I still do VPN in, wink, wink. Yeah. Uh, but 
I do more than most, and I do when I'm in like a hotel or, or an airport and things like that. You should and always you should, I, you should yeah. always use a VPN when you're yeah. out on the road. Yeah, yes. P- PSA, uh, trying <laughs> yes. to keep the security <laughs> folks happy. But realistically, when I'm and working, stay secure, not just keeping us happy. Well, doesn't we that make you, you happy when we? When we oh my gosh, stay it secure, definitely right? makes me happy. And it, but it, but really, I'm I'm just uh, a security advocate or an evangelist, whatever word you want to use. It is it is definitely important to not just from a security standpoint and a stability standpoint and a compliance standpoint and a data risk standpoint, you want to have a good patching program in place to address those vulnerabilities. Cause what we really want to do is reduce the attack surface. I mean, you yep. did mention people, which is a, which is probably a separate talk altogether. Uh, Cause I think we've covered the, the stuff that's on the, the on the, on the deck uh, that we we've talked about here. But basically, people will do what we encourage them to do. You know, so if we, if we give them the right tools and we give them information as to why they should apply a patch, you know, or why they should hit that reboot, you know, yeah. install the update, let's move on. Uh, I think that would be great. Um, it does take effort. But as we get back to the, the topic of patching, you know, so let's say you agree that it's a risk, that cybersecurity and patching are related. Then we want to talk about the program. How do you do it? What does a successful patching program look like? Um, in my mind, you get buy-in from the top. You know, you got to have leadership that agrees that they want to reduce the risk. And I can tell you this, if you talk to your CFO, they want to reduce risk because there's a direct correlation between risk and exposure and expense. So one of the, the people that I would usually go to to get buy-in is the CFO. I don't know if you see that that much. Um, I don't know who you normally get to talk to, whether it's always the IT or if you get the risk side of the house that want to say, you know, how much should I spend on vulnerability management? That would be a great question for a CFO to ask somebody. I think finance is always a part of it. It Typically, and this is I want your take on, it typically starts with the network team. Yeah. I don't know if that's just the customers I, I interact with, it seems like all patching tends to fall to the network um, to, yeah. to own, right? Obviously yeah. you need to work with the application teams. You need to work with the server teams. You need to, uh, obviously, like I was talking about people not VPNing in, how do we patch their their PCs off network, that sort of stuff. Right. There, there's other departments, but it, we tend to see that, the networking team. That is then quickly dotted line to the CISO who's yep. struggling. I see a lot of customers typically have a grasp on vulnerability. I want to come back to you okay. because that there is some tools, some really oh. good tools to help you understand uh, at least a quantity. Yes. Maybe you need help qual- qualifying it. Uh, but hey, you I've now got, have 250,000 vulnerabilities. It, it's the, the men in black scene where he says, Oh, there's a starship destroyer right above. It. And Tom Lee Jones says, calm down, man. There's always a starship <laughs> yeah. destroyer above. It. It's like, you always have a million vulnerabilities. It doesn't mean they're all going to, to, get you ransomware and we'll talk i want to talk about that in a second okay uh but i see network team dotted line to the CISO. cso the cfo or the finance team is so heavily involved because we see two factors one is uh eno policy cybersecurity, insurance oh yes the requirements of what those premiums look like sometimes it's to reduce premium sometimes it's we will not do it we oh, will yeah. not insure you without um, and then the, the yeah. second is how you typically, most people go automatically to solve that is we need to go hire people. We need bodies, bodies, bodies. And then we get back into this 12 month refresh life cycle of people moving on to other things. So I guess, how do you correlate if you are a CISO and you've run an automated scan, right? You've run, yeah. you've run Tenable and it said you have 800,000 vulnerabilities. What do you do next? What is prioritize. And there's a couple different ways you can do that. Um, if you're doing it in-house, and this is definitely something you can do in-house, you have to have a good skill set, you know, or at least a person or two people, depending on the size of your organization, that can understand the output from Nessus. Because you will get, let's, you know, make up an example. You're a decent sized organization. You've got 10,000 endpoints and plus 1,000 servers. You run a Nessus scan, you're going to come back potentially with 600, 700,000 vulnerabilities if you don't have a good patching program in place. Um, a lot of those are going to be either mediums or lows, which you can, depending on your environment, uh, defer for 60, 90, maybe even 120 days. You want to obviously look at the criticals. But the other thing you can look at besides just the criticals and the highs, 
CISA, the Cybersecurity Infrastructure Security Agency, has a list of known exploited vulnerabilities. It's a great resource because you could have, out of that, say, 700,000 vulnerabilities, you might have uh, 4,000 on your server farm. Well, that's where you're running your business. I mean, it's it's going to be very, very negative if the servers are attacked and hit with a vulnerability versus even 500 of your other 10,000 endpoints. So prioritization, uh, you have to know where your critical data is. You have to know what your critical assets are. You have to know what's the impact if I'm down for a minute, down for an hour, down for a day. You know, those are things that most mature CISOs would already have in their back pocket, so they would know. And then you can quantify it. I mean, that's what you have to do. You have to go look at your vulnerability list, quantify it, take it to your CFO, say, this is our exposure. This is the impact of the business if we get hit, you know, and give them quantifiable information. Otherwise, they won't be able to make a decision. And they, the CFO will feel a little paralyzed, like, I don't even know what to do with this. You told me I have 700,000 vulnerabilities, but I don't know what that means. That's a number. Does that make sense? It does. And you mentioned, you know, quantifying downtime and, and risk and, and where you run your business. I think a lot of patching tends to focus because I think the industry has focused a lot on tools and automation. Oh, they're right? easy Which to I mean, buy. Yeah, I understand why and then the marketplace. <clears throat> so what about my firewalls, my internet edge routers, my network equipment? What's do the not, magic tool? Do not tool? leave those exposed. What's my magic tool? What's my magic button that patches my network equipment that without any downtime, right? Oh, what, well, right? Like, so well, when we look at the program approach, I've got my magic tools and automation for PCs, for servers, maybe for some applications, but what's the magic button? How do you take on, I need to take down my core firewalls. I need to take down my core switches because I got to do an iOS patch. How does it see so without a partner like CBTS, what's kind of the thinking or the mindset and planning for that? Well, I certainly faced that dozens of times. Um, I had two different uh, vendors for firewalls, um, and you have to schedule downtime. And and in my environment, we were not twenty four seven operations. You know, we weren't an e commerce store that could never ever be down. Uh, we were a higher education environment, so we scheduled it for slow periods. You know, we would it, it could take eight hours to upgrade a firewall. Because sometimes that doesn't go well, and sometimes you're on the phone with the vendor, and you know that vendor's got to be available to you to say, "Oh, you tried to go from you know, you know OS version 7.1.2, and you went to 7.1.5. Right. You got to do 7.1.2, right. 0.3, Then you can go to 0.5, and then you get to be the one who finds the the, the uh, one the bug. known bug that yeah. didn't yeah that didn't make it through UAT yeah yeah and Been and there. and editing configuration files in a text editor when you're like looking at the clock going okay I gave everybody one more hour I'm either gonna have to send out a notification saying um, there's been a problem with this upgrade and the network will be offline for another two hours or you're like let's get it in there and let's see what happens so um, it is possible to do it by yourself it is possible to 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 and you definitely want to. There's been a number of vulnerabilities that have come out uh, in the, the Fortinet space, and I'm not picking yeah. on them, yeah, they, except they have 300. The last time I looked, the vulnerability was disclosed Jan June 1st or uh, May 29th. So very, you know, recent. They announced it. They got the patch out a day later, maybe two days later at the most. There were still 300,000 Fortinet firewalls with SSL VPN that had not been patched you know, 30 days later, that's a super high risk. That's, yeah. that's a big vulnerability. So, Hey guys, I'd like to jump in right now. Um, is patch management regulated by compliance and regulatory requirements today? It, yes. Yes. I touched on that very briefly about 10 minutes ago. Um, but there are definitely. To be fair, that was probably when the question came in, but I didn't want to interrupt you then. Oh. So <laughs> <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah, no, definitely. There are compliance uh, regu you know, compliance rules that you have to follow that will mandate patching. Um, the cadence, uh, I'm not familiar with a particular regulation off the top of my head, uh, but there are definitely regulations that require that you you do patching. And, and, and as you said, the cyber insurance folks are getting on the bandwagon too and saying, if you don't have a, you know, a patching program, just like if you don't have multi-factor authentication, we're not going to write an insurance policy for you. Yep. So that's that's a big vulnerability. Yeah, I, I think 
when it comes down to, we talk with customers all the time, and, and this is on average, we see about 55% successful patch rate uh, when I talk to customers. And I ask, and, by that, can, and by we're that, the ones who can score it. Yeah, right. Yeah. Some, some don't even score it. And when we do our patching as a service, it's a 95% SLA. Not only that, we're also... And you might want to explain to people what that means. Yeah, so so 95% of the things that we attempt to batch, we have a success rate of 95% of the things that are within our control. But we're also going to come back to you, for example, if we go and patch 1,000 desktops and eight fail because they don't have enough disk space, that's not going to hit our SLA. We're, we can't be responsible for your disk space. But you also know you've got eight laptops out there that probably need to be refreshed and and are probably overrun and, and overloaded. or and, know, that, and then it becomes a meaningful metric because correct. you've quantified your risk, which, again, as I said earlier, you know, the CFO wants to quantify this risk. They want to have an idea of how big is my exposure. And so I, I was thought, what, what are the two things that make us successful? And then we'll talk about a, a little bit of, of the value statement to the CFO. But to the CISO or to the network team, I look at two things. The first is internet facing relays, right? Oh my God. So yes. I don't need you to VPN into the network so I can hit your devices. That's huge. When you've got 20,000 devices out there and most people are using SaaS applications and O365 and not coming into the network as much, an internet facing relay, also not to mention not having to build out as many deep distribution points or relays in your network to, to take those patches. But the second piece is we are not, the friend of the application owner or the server owner. Yeah. I see all the time, hey, we're going to patch this server on Saturday at two in the morning. Right. Uh, I've got a friend's wedding that weekend. I can't be available. Can you exclude? Because my application's running on that server. <laughs> oh, sure. Right. Because we, you know, see each other in the break room. Right. All of a sudden, a third party, it's, you know, and we build out this schedule where we'll build out here's your maintenance windows and here's your fallback. You right. can be excused. We understand you might have something, then it's going to automatically get patched in the secondary window. Right. And so I think removing that personal element of, hey, do me a favor. Oh, yeah. I don't want to be involved in this this patching um, has been a huge success. The second, you know, for the, so that's on the network and the CISO side, why our 95% is so attainable. Uh, why to a CFO it's so important, we've talked about today I need a good tool for vulnerability scanning. I got to pick what that is. I got to get a good tool for patch management. I got to pick what that is. Maybe a tool for automation. That's a third tool. Depending on the size of the org. Yep. yep. Now, I, and we talked about that does nothing for me in my network world where I still need to, you know, review the release notes when they come out and look for backwards incompatibilities and, and, and schedule downtime to take, you know, all of these sorts of things. But you started out by saying, well, I'm scheduling like four hours a month to maintenance, right? At a minimum, now, right. Right. Now, I'm sure that's grown, but let's say yeah. it's 40 hours a month. Let's say it's 80 hours a month. That's still, how do you go and build a dedicated full-time team to this? And so there's an economy of scale where we say, you're going to have to go and buy two, maybe three tools, maybe more. I'm sure there's plenty of tool sprawl in this space and shelfware. And you're going to have to hire a team who does this as their main job. But also, they're only going to be doing it 40% of their time. What else do you want them to do? What else do you want them to do? Yeah. Or you can hit an easy button for a full package wrapped in. We're going to bring the tools to the table for for vulnerability scanning, vulnerability assessments, vulnerability remediation. We're going to bring the tools for patching. We'll bring the tools for automation. We'll bring the people, project managers. We'll oversee all of your different departments that need to be engaged in a patch. All for a fixed monthly fee. And all of a sudden, your folks can go and do their own you know, what they want to focus on. Yeah. When you're sitting in your CISO chair, talk to me about the benefit of that versus is there a concern of handing that over to somebody else? Do you want to hand that over? Is there a little like um, tepid, it, tepidation? Uh, I always operated with a very lean staff. I was uh, never, n- nobody ever came to me with a pile of money and said, John, improve, uh, you know, our cybersecurity posture. I always had to take advantage of every disaster whenever it occurred. You know, if it was a hard drive in a server that failed and suddenly email wasn't available for three days and you'd think I had taken candy from several small babies and the screams and wails uh, were deafening to say the least. So, you know, there are, as a, as a CISO, when you're in that seat, there's definitely an advantage to being able to say, look, this is a fixed specific window. We've got a vendor partner that we trust that, you know, and, you know, yeah, your application 
you know, might fail. Now, again, in that case, you always want to have a test environment so that you can test out these patches before you roll them out. So you don't end up with that window that has to slide to a longer length of time. But um, I definitely like having partners that I can rely on to, to defer this to, because like I said, patching is essentially a commodity. It's essentially a small, I mean, it's a very critical point, but it's a thing that very few people want to do. And it's the, and once you get good at doing it, which CBTS is, uh, because I've talked with uh, Krista Brunner and the, the guys that are on that team, this is rote. I mean, you want to get somebody that this is their bread and butter. They're used to doing it. It's not going to be a surprise. But if you're a little bit of a control freak, and I'm not saying that I am, but some people might have said I am, you know, you, you're a little worried about handing off that patching to somebody until you have that trust. So I can see why it would take a little bit of time to develop that trust to say, all right, we're going to, you know, kick the tires a little bit. Let's see what happens. You know, maybe we'll do a 12 month contract. We're not going to do 36 months, but you know, let's see how it goes. And when you can start to return reports and SLA is at 95%, you're going to build up a lot of trust yeah. in, in your vendor partner and say, okay, I've mitigated a risk and you can go back to your cyber insurance carrier and say, boom, see, we've got this. And then you get deliverables, you get reports, you get reports that say, we've, this is our patch rate. One of the customers I work with, you know, they had a patch window. I was working with them and I said, you know, here's a patch. And they're like, oh, that's an application. We haven't really patched that server for a year. And I'm like, that's not good. And I said, how critical is it to your environment? Well, you know, every teacher uses it. I was like, okay, that's critical. And I said, why haven't you patched it? Well, because every teacher uses it. I'm like, okay, that's redundant and circular. But I said, let's patch this over a weekend and be prepared to fall back in case it doesn't come up gracefully after a year of missed patches. They followed half of my advice. <laughs> they did do it over a weekend. They didn't have that fallback. So they were down for a week uh, while they worked with the vendor because the vendor didn't have hadn't updated the application to address the vulnerabilities that were in it. Once that was done, suddenly um, a critical piece of their infrastructure was not vulnerable to a whole catalog of exploits because they got it patched. And that's, I mean, again, that's people, you know, hey, we don't want to, we'll give you a pass on it. And the more you kick the can down the road, the harder it, it gets. Doesn't get, it does, doesn't yeah, get better. Take a, take a bite of the elephant. Um, and we see a lot of customers, we're talking about earning the trust. Maybe it's, hey, here's my endpoints or my yeah. cloud-based servers, things that I can quickly, you know, migrate workloads or something like that. And we work up. To, to network, right? But yep. it's ew. think about how many vulnerabilities you solve just by successfully patching yeah. PCs. Hey Lance? guys, uh, yeah, I have another question that came in. Uh, are there any applications or assessments in place to help uh, a company understand what assets and inventory they have to figure out uh, where they even want to start with oh, the patching sure. program? Uh, I mean, Tenable, Nessus, I mean, that's the, the known vulnerability scanning tool that's out there. Their Qualys is another vendor yep. that's out there. Um, I'm sure there's a third one, but off the top of my head, Tenable and Qualys seem to have the majority of the market. I don't know what else you... Uh, so those are the two I run into the most. So Tenable is a great partner of ours. Um, I do run into to Qualys quite a bit. Uh, I think that the other aspect is what is an assessment, not just a tool to say, hey, here's the vulnerabilities that we, you have, meaning the CVEs that have been reported yes. by OEMs in the internet community, but what are my other vulnerabilities? And we have an entire program here dedicated to those types of assessments of coming in and not just running an automated scan of what your vulnerabilities are, but trying to penetrate you, doing a yes. penetration test and trying True. to go east west and trying to show that would you be the team or, I'm on. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. Our yeah. security team, we have uh, seven or eight vulnerability and penetration testers who can see whether or not, okay, you've patched your servers and your systems. Can we still get in? Yeah. And that's yeah. important. I think that's wildly important. I think the way we structure our security practice here of kind of separation of church and state. So we we've got our team of professional services that come in and do the assessments or we'll do the remediation work. We'll be an extension of your security team. Uh, we then have the security services where we do it for you, right? sure. where you just hand it over to us. Uh, and then we have our security experts around. There are a ton of tools and tool sprawls and, I see every day a new logo that I'm like, what's that? I've never heard of that. And then I go and Google and they're, you know, the latest in whatever you want to call it. They're the latest SOAR technology and trying to keep up with security acronyms is harder than networking. <laughs> so I, to me, the fact that we can come in and, and we're the puzzle piece, you tell us where you want to fit in. We'll come in, 
spend six months in your environment letting you know exactly what's there, what's vulnerable, and then can tell you, here's what you should do to fix it. And then you can say, hey, we'd like you to, okay, to we'll, fix it. We'll like right. you to fix it. Or we'd like you to buy those tools from you to fix it. Or we're done. We're done growing this team. Can you just be an easy button for us to make our life easy? And what I enjoy about that is not only does it make the customer's life easy, it makes Krista Brunner's life harder. And I get a little <laughs> bit of joy out of that as well. <laughs> he's he's a, he's He's got a big challenge. But uh, the good thing is he's done it for dozens of customers with Tens of thousands of endpoints. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, Chris, shout out to Chris Brunner. Good job. You should be down here. Yeah, so it sounds to me like it's just not as easy as purchasing an application and installing it and boom, you're ready. You're right? you, I mean, it sounds like we need you need experts involved, whether that's in staff, you know, using your current staff or outsourcing. Well, okay. experience is uh, gleaned from uh, it, doing things and not getting the result you want. So if you if you don't have the experience, you either buy it or you're going to get it the hard way. Yeah. So. yeah. And by the way, uh, how many customers are 100% safe from ever, you know, whether they're a right. yeah. customer or not? How many companies out there are 100% safe from a vulner from getting attacked? At zero. Zero, right? right. It's, not, it's not if, it's what. Yes. Right? Yeah. And, but the advantage is... I, I'll show you. I have no computers in my business. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Says the man surrounded by technology. Right. Um you know, uh, Gartner had this statistic out, and I know we're getting close to time. Um, 80 to 90 percent of the attacks are tied to a vulnerability. And typically what happens these days, yes, it's probably going to be a phishing email. But once malware is deployed on an endpoint, somebody's computer, they then look for a vulnerability somewhere else to exploit. Yep. So, yes, you can say that the end user is one of the main attack surfaces. I, I certainly wouldn't dis disagree with that statement. But... If you have patched endpoints, if you have patched network gear, if you have patched servers, yeah, the malware's downloaded, the malware has, you know, detonated. They may not be able to get a, you know, escalation of privileges. They may, be, may not be able to do anything else after that because you've kept your environment yeah. patched. You got in the building, but every room's locked. Yeah, exactly. And, and guys, there's another good one that came in. And this, you know, we hear the buzzword zero trust all the time, right? And, and, the, and they're asking, I live by zero trust, Lance. <laughs> I got you. I don't trust you. That's for sure. <laughs> How does patching play into zero trust uh, buzzword? If, uh, it, if it does at all. How does yeah, it play into that? Uh, patching is, well, patching is not a specific part of the NIST zero trust framework, but it would be a part of a standard security practice. Um, yeah, what I, here's what I would say is, like, there's the, the NIST definition on ZTNA, uh, that I'm sure John would recite backwards. It's only on page 17. Uh, but I think of ZTNA as almost you know, every employee is a firewall. And I know it goes further than that now if every application is also a firewall and all of those things. But at its root, ZTNA is me as an individual. I have an identity and what can I access? And so to me, patching of endpoints, whether that be my mobile device, whether it be my PC, is part of keeping me as an individual. I'm a firewall. I need to be true. So I've got 20,000 employees. You've got 20,000 firewalls. That's what ZTNA, you know, and so patching along with, along with endpoint detection and response and along with, I'm not saying it's uh, right. foolproof, but so I wouldn't say it's part of the ZTNA framework, but to me, ZTNA is making every employee their own firewall, patching any device that they're bringing to access company information would certainly go a long way. In that. Yeah. And just one final thing on that in terms of, one of the core components of zero trust is to make sure that the device that you log into, so you yep. log into your phone, you can log into a PC, you present identity credentials, and then if you have a, a zero trust uh, environment deployed, and remember folks, it's not a product, it's not a SKU, it's a principle um, or a guiding principle. So you present identity credentials on a device you should be able to interrogate that device automatically to determine whether or not it has the correct posture, where you could say, have the latest patches been applied? Right. And if the latest patches are not applied, you get, then you don't, you don't get, get access. access. Right. So yes, Lance, to, that was a really long-winded answer to your question. And, and to be fair, I hope I didn't hurt your feelings. I trust you a little bit. <laughs> a little bit. I completely <laughs> understand that, yes. Yeah. Um, I think we're at time um, and I will uh, wrap this up by saying uh, seriously to anybody listening uh, you should have a patching program even if you're just doing Microsoft patch Tuesday on your personal home computer 
Uh, you want to stay patched. Um, Apple released a patch yesterday uh, for their iOS devices. There are, the world's changed. We're all targets of attack by various threat actors, criminals, uh, and you want to do the simple things, patch your devices, patch your mobile devices, patch your laptops, and stay safe out there. Can't beat that. <laughs> Can't touch that. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks, everybody, for joining today. Thank you, Johns. It yes. was great. And uh, until next time, take thanks, care. Thanks, Lance. Thanks, Lance.